We all know that getting a company to embrace a new technology has many challenges, not least if you're trying to get people to think in a functional way when they're used to more imperative languages. Uh, Tim has experience with driving the adoption of Scala in a Fortune 15 company. Along the way, he's learned much, and in his talk, he's going to share some of his insights, uh, both social and in coding terms. Tim's talk title is Enterprise Algebra. Okay, thank, thank you, everybody. Um, so, uh, good morning, uh, my name, or afternoon even, because it was meant to be tomorrow morning, but now it's this afternoon. Um, I feel like I should say like what my favorite monad is or something like you know. Um, anyway, uh, I'm, I'm the infrastructure engineering lead at Verizon. Uh, I guess this is a UK audience, so for those who don't know, uh, Verizon runs a, a large part of the internet actually, uh, the backbone of the internet. Um, uh, we also have one of the largest cell networks uh, in the world, um, and you know we have you know many millions of TV customers and all this kind of thing. So many many different things. We're a large telecommunications company. Um, I guess for me personally, if you've been around in the community for a few years, you would probably know each other. Uh, next year will be my 10 year anniversary for doing Scala, so um, I feel kind of old at this point. Um, anyway, um, so I kind of dropped off the mailing list and stuff uh, uh, probably about four or five years ago. I uh, decided I would leave rainy England and move to California and basically build like a kick ass functional programming team to, uh, to work on some cool products. And, and, uh, and you know, sort of by acquisition, uh, you know, from Intel to Verizon, we ended up at Verizon. And, uh, you know, so this is our Tuesday. Uh, you know, we've got some really awesome people working for us and uh, so super blessed to have uh, a really lucky, a really awesome team. Uh, I'm sure most people know, uh, uh, you know, at least one or two people in this picture. Uh, and it's only a small fraction of the great people we have in the team. So. Um, if you're in the United States, probably not here, but if you are, uh, and you're interested in doing functional programming or infrastructure engineering, uh, hit me up on Twitter, Google me, whatever. Um, so uh, we love functional programming. Um, so sort of as an extension of what uh, Raul was saying in the previous talk, by and large, uh, we're very invested in the functional programming part of Scala. Um, we don't really do object orientation. It's not really a thing we do. Um, so, um, you know, it's not like when we talk to certain teams, you know, you talk to certain people from larger companies, they might say, yeah, you know, we're doing Scala. You know, there's a slight wink or a slight, you know, slight small smile, uh, you know, because really they mean they're doing like Scala like it's Java just without the semicolons, um, you know. So we're actually doing Scala, you know, co-products and all. Uh, so, um, you know, so I'm going to be talking to you about that today and, and you know, the fun we have. Uh, and uh, um, yeah, hopefully it will give you a bit of insight into into what we've been doing. Um, I do want to just have a quick, sort of quick sidebar, which is that we've been doing a bunch of OSS stuff. Um, so uh, we've sort of actively been uh, trying trying to basically push a lot of our internal projects uh, into the open because uh, they're very generic, and a lot of the stuff we're doing um, simply because of the amount of engineering weight and muscle we have um, that allows us to make a lot of ground sort of fairly quickly. And um, we have a lot of useful utilities that we're trying to push out. Um, and these are all sort of uh, libraries that rely heavily on uh, combinators. They're not they're not like inheritance or anything like that. They don't get in your way. It's a take it or leave it a la carte kind of thing. And uh, uh, like some of the libraries we already open sourced, uh, Knobs is a configuration system. Uh, Remotely is a like fast functional binary RPC system built on S codec. Um, uh, and I guess uh, you know a little bit little bit early, but I'm going to announce that we're going to do. We've also got already got approval to do several other things. Um, they'll be coming in the next few weeks, so check out my Twitter. Uh, one is basically a SBT plugin called Blockade uh, that allows you to centrally manage like dependency management. I'll be talking a little bit about that later. Um, uh, Helm, which is a free algebra for working with a, a HashiCorp console, uh, and Memento, which is a fast, uh, a fast lightweight uh, token generation system for security tokens. Um, but we'll, you know they'll be coming in the next sort of several few weeks, and you know if you've got any questions about those, you can ask me later. Um, so to give you an idea of sort of the breadth of where we're at uh, with one of our programs, and you know there are sort of many programs internally, um, we're currently sitting about a thousand repos on our internal GitHub enterprise. Uh, so we are sort of not small. Um, uh, I don't have any hard data uh, specifically because I don't know what other companies are doing. Um, but given we've sort of got like eight or nine hundred SBT projects and they're all multi-module, uh, we're probably one of the biggest users of SBT in the world. Um, we have uh, some very serious extensions to SBT. Um, I'll be talking about that in the next slide. Uh, we're also not 100% Scala. So if someone's sort of like, oh my god, why aren't you 100% Scala? Uh, it's because we do some things to do with satellites and uh, head-end encoders and things like that that are, uh, basically just can't get performance on the JVM and we have to be native. So um, 
you know, just some implementation details. But by and large, we're, we're, we're uh, pretty much a scholar shop uh, for the vast majority of our systems. Um, so we have like 11 of our own uh, internal SPT plugins. Uh, these things do everything you might imagine. Um, so we have heavy, heavy automation of basically everything. Um, and so uh, some actors like command and control, some are release management, um, you know, but the net net result is that builds are like super plug and play for people, uh, and it sort of cuts down the vast, vast, you know, majority. there's no boilerplate for them. Uh, they literally just turn on the plugin, and the plugin figures out whether or not it's running on a CI system, is it doing a release, and it just figures all that stuff out. And so literally, it's just like add the plugin, and they're, they're good to go, uh, which is, is kind of quite a different story to what most people uh, uh, have when they, when they do these things. Um, so uh, ironically, just as a, a small sort of segue, uh, in previous years, before we decided to do this, uh, we actually tried to educate users about SBT. Um, one of the guys on my team likes to joke that it's called the sentient build tool uh, because you know it's, it's really difficult to understand. Uh, but the bottom line is that that didn't really scale. Uh, and it wasn't anything to do with SBT. Uh, we'd have had the same problem if it was Maven because it's basically people don't care about builds. Like, they, they really just don't care about it. Uh, there's such little interest in it that it's kind of like, you know, even if we would do sessions or education on it, um, you know, people just want it to work. It's just a clerical administration detail for them. They're more interested in shipping their product. Uh, like, we would continually get uh, uh, questions like, you know, so, like, what does that operate, what does it operate with, like, the sort of sick face emoji? Like, what does that do again? And, and so all of these kind of things are just, you know, no one needs to care about that stuff, and nor should they. So we, we sort of built big infrastructure around doing that, and it, and it works awesomely. Um, and it sort of avoids, uh, you know, wasting education resources on something people basically don't don't care about. Um, SBT, by the way, uh, auto plugins are like actually really awesome once you understand them. Um, I remember when we first got our large web of, of, of plugins migrated over, it was, it's kind of like the parting of waves in some senses. Uh, you know, it is, it is really awesome. But um, for end users, it's basically like advanced technology from an alien race. It's just, it's just not something that, you know, you can really understand unless you put like actual time in to learn it. Um, so uh, if you do build them, uh, make sure they're solid. Make sure you as the author actually knows what it's doing um, and why it's doing it, uh, which means you need to understand some of the SBT internals. Uh, and doing that is sort of incredibly valuable, but even with like you know, sort of nine years of Scala and Wimbell, I still get that wrong from time to time. And you know, it, it's non-trivial, but it's extremely beneficial. So uh, that would be the sort of message I would leave you with. Um, Anyway, uh, so this kind of size requires like basically aggressive automation of absolutely every single thing. Uh, it's essentially um, uh, what my team does most of the time. Um, so whether or not it's things like um, uh, build systems or uh, more mundane things like logging or monitoring or, um, or uh, uh, more exotic things like uh, uh, anomaly detection, uh, all of these things fall in, under the remit of my team. Uh, we're a pretty small team and uh, um, we get a lot done. Functional programming helps us do that. Um, and uh, yeah, I think bottom line, we have an awful lot of fun while we're doing it, and uh, yeah. So you know, how do we basically work? Um, so we have a couple of driving principles. Um, some of the, and, you know, these are things that Runar talked about in his keynote uh, here at Scholar World last year. Um, and so sort of this principle of like, you know, constraints liberate, but liberties constrain, uh, that's like a really driving principle about the way we design systems. Um, so you always want the minimally powerful thing. Um, if you have something that's like additionally powerful, it's like it typically that gets used for evil. Um, and so, uh, sort of our side motto is, uh, 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 you know, I always like people to plan for evil because, you know, if they don't, then you know, something we get sort of caught in a, an interesting sort of web of technical debt. So, uh, sort of second driving tenant, I would say, would be that you know, one uses frameworks, but frameworks use you. Um, and so we favor libraries and combinators for basically nearly every aspect of system building. Uh, I generally consider frameworks kind of to be pretty much an anti pattern, to be honest. Um, uh, they're kind of dangerous for building large systems. Um, so inter internally, we operate uh, an open source model of development. Um, and so my infrastructure team uh, basically builds libraries and uh, tools and lots of other things that, uh, you know, they touch every other team in the organization. So it becomes kind of. Uh, I guess for us, very dangerous in terms of uh, if we create debt, uh, it, it's, not, it's not just like we have a service that we can refactor, it's like literally everywhere. So we, we're very, very careful about that and, and we, we're very kind of uh, conservative with our choices and how we make things. And, and so subsequently we end up with a, a lot of forks and things and I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, um, because because we rely on this sort of uh, nature of combinators, um, and we preside a suite of things, and we document them well, and they have a consistent API. Uh, development teams basically can uh, they can operate in a sort of 
don't think mana. They actually have to say, okay, what problem am I solving? And here are all the things that I know that solve all these problems, and I need to see like which problem solves which, to which matches which tool. And we make that super easy for them. Um, but we sort of want to horizontally in integrate systems, not vertically integrate systems. Um, and so uh, naturally, there are certain parts of the system that are kind of ver vertically vertically integrated, uh, like for performance reasons, like a, like a, a specialized rack or machine placements uh, inside the data center in order to like assume a degree of data locality. You get those kind of vertical integrations, but typically we kind of you know sort of horizontally integrate with different libraries and, and such across the teams, as opposed to them knowing about the absolute inner details of all the things that we do. Um, so absolutely can't talk about any of this without talking about education. Um, so it is absolutely fair to say that we grew very quickly. And so, um, you know, with this frame, we've learned a lot about how, or I believe we've learned a lot about educating uh, and sort of onboarding new engineering staff. Um, you know, we have a lot, we're very, very lucky to have a lot of amazing people, um, you know, but we also have a lot of people who are Java refugees or, uh, you know, who came from C++ or, um, you know, so, and, and, you know, that background is, is a benefit, by the way. I don't class that as a negative because they don't know Haskell. It's, you know, those people come with, like, in the case of the Java people, a lot of those people come with, you know, immense depth of knowledge of the JVM, about how to debug the JVM, how to handle GC pressure. Um, so these things are valuable, but we need to reskill them so that they can actually, you know, they can actually uh, uh, sort of be enabled with functional programming. And so I kind of cons consider this in sort of this... Uh, multi-step kind of way. And the first thing is kind of like, when anyone new joins the team, there's a kind of a degree of evangelism that has to happen. So for my team, it's like mainly like a, a, an ongoing set of evangelism um, to, you know, to basically preach the benefits of pro functional programming. Uh, much like uh, the previous talk was just talking about with error handling and such, uh, these are really common things that um, um, you know, are good uh, gateway drugs into, in, into, uh, into functional programming. Um, so there's always this period of like uh, self-learning, self-directed learning, uh, and so that typically is books and text and online resources. Uh, and then there's a, what we rely on is um, um, centrally centralized education doesn't scale in an organization of our size. So we, we rely heavily on managers and uh, on managers, tech leads, and, and you know other coworkers to help out their coworkers. And so. Um, uh, we sort of have rely on dissemination of techniques uh, of different things. So type classes is a good one. Uh, it's pretty easy to implement, easy to understand. It's just sort of a pattern from most people's perspective. Uh, so, you know, very easy to disseminate. Um, then obviously there's a whole period of practice, practice, practice. Uh, sort of knowing the path is not the same as walking the path and being able to apply it to your own applications. Uh, and then we kind of come back and, you know, once they're kind of ready for some of the higher level stuff, um, you know, we, we can do some internal courses, internal training material, and, and you know, obviously they can always drop into our our Slack channel and ask whatever uh, you know, ever uh, uh, whatever questions they would like, um, and then obviously, like everyone, including myself, uh, more practice, uh, rinse and repeat, pretty much for you know the rest of our careers, because uh, you know we never learn it all. Um, so um, uh, so yeah, so talking about uh, some real world real world applications of functional programming, um, you know. Sort of is perfectly obvious if you understand monads, but um, I do just want to give a quick shout out to uh, HList. Um, there's a very interesting thing that happens with HList. So for for HList specifically, um, by the way, who doesn't know what an HList is? Okay, we got like two honest people in here, so that's awesome. Um, so. Um, <laughs> Um, so okay, so for those who don't know, HList is basically like a uh, instead of list of a or list of ints. Um, you could have uh, uh, like a list of uh, that might be like position zero might be a banana, position two might be a, a, an orange, position three might be a tomato, uh, and, a, um, and position four would be a banana, and so on and so on. So it's basically like a list where each, each element can be different. And, um, and there are some constraints, but um, the bottom line is when you iterate over it, it's typed. So you know what the type is, it's not just the A. Um, so if you have multiple different things uh, that don't extend the same base, uh, or you, you don't end up with the, um, you know, with the mob being the same thing. So, I kind of class this as being, you know, the advanced gateway drug for Scala. Uh, it's probably, probably in more of our services and libraries than anything else. Probably because it's easier to understand for most people, uh, and it gets people excited about uh, being able to leverage the type system. Uh, and so, I think I kind of feel like when people do use it for the first time, they uh, they feel like they've really accomplished something for themselves uh, about being able to understand it. Especially if they implement like a poly one, like a polymorphic map over the H list. Um, these things are, are um, the experience of that is very quick and easy and very empowering for users. Um, so I, I definitely, uh, I definitely kind of recommend that as, as kind of a, a gateway. Um, so uh, so yeah. So I'm going to jump into a few things. I'm really glad that Raul kind of mentioned like 
free and things because I was, guess I was kind of assuming people just know what free monad is. Um, so I'm going to be talking today about three main things. Uh, uh, free monads, uh, co-unator, uh, and the unator lemma. And uh, I'm also going to be talking about co-products. Uh, and then we'll be talking about a couple of things after that. Uh, application design, functional application design, uh, and sort of figuring out where the end of the world is. So, uh, free. It's been talked about probably like three times already today, so I'm just going to fly through a couple of slides just to kind of give a general idea, because I'm pretty sure everyone's kind of familiar at this point. Um, but free is a super simple structure. Uh, it basically has, uh, uh, for some type constructor and some A, uh, and there are typically, this is how it's implemented in Scala C. Uh, there are simply two uh, two case classes, uh, return and, and suspend. So the trick here being that uh, uh, return basically doesn't do anything, right? Just you give it an A and it will lift the A, and you know there's nothing really to say about that. So the interesting part is, of course, uh, you know this part, the F, the, the S argument, which is an F of free of F of A. Um, so in order to actually access the F uh, in the supplied S argument, uh, it's required that F is a functor such that we can map. Uh, uh, you know, the supplied argument. And so there's this interesting thing that happens when you start building out uh, infrastructure based on free, is that you find yourself, uh, um, you find yourself basically writing these boilerplate functors for basically every algebra. And, and that becomes kind of tedious, um, which brings us sort of neatly onto this thing called the Yoneda lemma. Now, um, so what the Yoneda lemma says is that if you have a function defined like this, uh, which is simple, uh, you know, uh, a to B function, uh, then you certainly have a type of FA. Um, and so that is to say that these functions typically are implemented. So if you think about, uh, for example, a list, list of A, uh, list of A has map. Uh, and so the map function looks exactly like this. Um, so we can say that, you know, list is a functor. Um, and so the neat thing about this, um, actually, before I show that, um, so the neat thing about this is that. Um, yeah, if you certainly have this, uh, uh, if you certainly have this functor, or if you certainly have this f, um, and we know we can map on it, then that allows us to basically remove some boilerplate, which will become which is super useful in a minute. So the actual Yoneda uh, is implemented like this. Uh, so nothing very fancy. Looks very very straightforward. Um, by the way, if I'm going too fast or anyone has any questions, just holler as I go through. And so we can prove it just like this. Uh, we can just simply make a uh, make a unada uh, and uh, give it the give it the identity function. Make sure that it matches uh, matches our expectations. Uh, you know, not, there's nothing really particularly interesting about this. This is kind of it's like neat that that's a property of it, but it's not. Uh, uh, there's nothing particularly useful about that per se. Um, so why is this even useful? Um, now this is actually very. So what happens is that with this uh, with this rule or with this law. Um, or with lemma, sorry, specifically, um, it actually works in reverse. So, uh, and this is called co-unator. So, uh, I know someone's probably thinking, you know, what are these co-things, but it's, it's honestly not as scary as it sounds. Um, so, if we think about co-unator, uh, uh, this is actually how it's implemented, again, in, in Scala-C. Um, uh, there's this inner type signature, or this is inner type in, um, called i, uh, and then there's f of i, where i, and this function is basically the reverse. I don't know if you can see this one. Yeah, so the, the val k is i to a. Uh, and so in our case, we've got uh, f of a. And so we can say that um, uh, the co a co-unator f of a uh, is isomorph isomorphic to f a. Um, and so the i basically kind of captures the inverse of the function. Uh, and I'll be explaining why this is useful in a minute. Uh, by the way, there's a ton of stuff online about this, a ton of stuff in the source code. Uh, definitely go and check it out. It's, there's a little bit too much to kind of go through in a presentation, so I hope the meaning kind of gets across. Um, but it's easier to show usage. So, uh, so yeah, this is kind of pretty cool, right? That we can invert the thing and still have this reasoning about the fact that uh, uh, you know this, that we can still we can still obtain the f of a uh, even when we have a uh, you know a b in an f of a. So, if we think about where we were, um, you know, that's to say our, our suspend. Uh, we think about free, then we can kind of reasonably conclude that uh, you know free definitions uh, that use coordinator uh, can you know allow us as the implementer to basically remove this requirement to have uh, um, you know to have a particular function uh, have a functor for the specific thing. Uh, That's to say because we know that there will always be this uh, this map function, we can kind of rely on this as a property uh, which allows us to not have uh, uh, to not have to supply the functor instance. Um, 
And so this is actually a very, very convenient thing. So if we're defining free algebras um, uh, a lot, which you know, it turns out we are, um, then what I really want is I kind of always want to get a free uh, that, is, uh, that, that is using Coyonator. And so that's actually implemented as a convenience type constructor in Scala-Z, which looks like this. Um, and so all it says, uh, so free C, uh, which is so given some, a, some S uh, and then an A, uh, and then there's a free, the type lambda fx coordinator sx, uh, give me the F, which gives you the inner one, if, if that makes sense. Um, if you're not familiar with type lambdas, that's, I definitely won't cover that in this talk. It's definitely kind of a, uh, a definitely more advanced uh, talk, but um, yeah, so this property basically allows us to create free algebras where we don't have to supply a functor instance specifically. Uh, so. That's, that's all you need to know. From a user's perspective, that's all you need to know. So I'm going to talk to you about this nomad monad, uh, which is really awesome to say. Uh, uh, so for those who don't know, um, uh, as I mentioned earlier, like one of the things we work on is the data centers. And so uh, one of the things we do use is this thing called nomad, um, which is a, a data center scheduler. And uh, it's kind of somewhat similar to uh, Apache Mesos or Google Kubernetes. Um, so schedulers are kind of generally designed to commoditize your data center operations and uh, you know so on and so on. Nomad is basically this blazing fast scheduler that you know um, you know if you've got like 20k cores, you can deploy like thousands and thousands of containers a second on it and run like millions and millions of containers in production. So uh, so it's pretty awesome. So let's say that we wanted to make a free a free algebra for the, for using the scheduler API. So it's super simple. We'll just do it in a couple of slides. And uh, hopefully I'll show you know why it's uh, uh, why it's useful to uh, uh, to enable, to use Coyonator or to have that plumbing in there for us to avoid us having to supply the functor instance. So we have the scheduler up, um, and we're going to have two uh, uh, two things in our algebra: uh, basically launch something and delete something. Um, super simple. We could do other things, but for the sake of demo, we just won't. Then we're going to supply this uh, the scheduler f type. So we've got scheduler f of a, um, and what we're going to say is we've got. Uh, Free and free C. Now, if you remember from the pre earlier slide, that free C automatically puts the uh, um, uh, puts the supplied argument in in, in a coordinator. So we can say scheduler op, uh, which was our algebra, and give me some a. So when we kind of wire this together and we say, okay, like we're gonna have some syntactic function which is delete, and you know it probably takes some arguments, you know whatever the the reference for the reference for the particular thing we want to destroy is, um, and uh, uh, it's a side effect, so it will be you know. And uh, uh, this thing is going to re return the scheduler f type. Now, um, and this is actually super convenient that Raul covered it because I'm kind of skipping over some of these things for, for time. Um, but um, when we implement the uh, the interpreter for this thing, that's to say, we pr we supply a natural transformation from uh, our scheduler op, which is our algebra, uh, to uh, you know basically some kind of I, I just execution context or some 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 monad, right? And in this case, I'm going to use Scala-Z task. And so all I have to do is implement some kind of apply function um, or some natural transformation from scheduler op to task, and uh, um, and then basically pattern match just like Raoul did in, in his previous talk. Um, so super easy, but the really, really nice property about this, particularly when it comes to IO actions uh, or anything that kind of uh, reaches out or has some external state, is that it makes it testable. Because I can just provide another implementation of, of, of this interpreter. I don't, have to, uh, I don't have to do any crazy dancing magic. I can just literally just prov provide verbatim a totally, different, a totally different implementation. And so this kind of concept of like a... Sort of sh separating definition versus, uh, you know, versus the actual interpretation, and therefore, you know, the execution of that thing uh, is immensely powerful. Uh, so, if you have a small library or something, and, and you, you know your implementation of your interpreter matters, like for example, maybe you're only doing I/O, um, then there are a couple of cases where where it can be a little bit difficult. That's to say, if if, if you're only if basically the library has no discernible. Uh, uh, you know, business logic, then it can be a little bit tricky, and you know, you have to do some other tricks for testing. But, um, but, uh, but by and large, this is sort of very, very enabling. And I'll talk a little bit later about um, uh, uh, why it's useful uh, in application design, and you know, uh, how we can use it. So the interesting thing about these things is that once you start to use them, uh, you kind of really start seeing this thing everywhere, uh, and sort of everything can be seen as a free algebra, and so. You end up in the sort of next logical step as well. I have like free algebra one and you know free algebra two. Oops, next slide. Free algebra two, and I kind of want to use them together. I want to reason about them together. Like do this, then this. Do this, then this. You know, and that I might have two algebras. I might have like five algebras. Like you know, and, and every different every different sort of subsystem is kind of like its own program. Um, so I can kind of end up with like a program that has other programs in it. And so 
if we have something like this, for example, um, you know, by default, uh, even though it's a fairly natural thing we want to do, this just won't compile. Um, and the reason is, is because uh, you know, the sort of surrounding types, as it were, um, are, are divergent. They, they, they're, they're not the same. And the compiler is trying to insist that they are the same. So it, it just doesn't compile. So this is kind of what brings forward this, this, sort of, uh, this structure called code product. Now, uh, code product is kind of a scary name. It's another code thing. Um, but it, it's really not that bad. Um, and it's actually super easy to use. So um, it just takes an F and some G and an A again. And then it will, it will tell you, if anyone was at Rob's talk earlier about Doobie and fixed point types, um, uh, you know, this is kind of a very similar thing. Um, it's just a disjunction FA to GA. So we can see that this is our first algebra, and this is our second algebra. And uh, um, what we can do is if we want to say, OK, we've got two algebras, our quarks op and our foo op. So just like our scheduler op, uh, we've made two other algebras uh, in exactly the same way, nothing too crazy there. And we made this, uh, this com bot. And so um, if I then say, OK, I'm going to say I've got a combot of f. Um, and just to go over that again, I've got a combot, which is a coproduct quarks foo op of a. So specifically, that thing is the, uh, uh, that's kind of our, uh, our operation algebra, if you, if you like, if you're trying to draw an analogy with, with just making a straight up, uh, straight up free. So I can say I've got a combef, uh, free of free c, again, the coordinator. I recall that from earlier. And I can say that uh, this thing is a free c of combot. Now, what I want to do is I want to say, OK, like I've got this, uh, uh, you know, this combot, this four, four comprehension. So now the actual outer surrounding types, uh, you know, they can actually be used together. This is what we want to get to. So obviously, we're missing some steps because, you know, how did this actually work? Now, this works very neatly. So we obviously, let's look at the implementation for uh, use quarks and, and, and use foo. So uh, they look a little bit like this. So we just say that we've got two functions, both, both, both algebras. Let's just say they have uh, some go, go, go method on them. It doesn't really matter. Uh, what, what it does is kind of not, not, not relevant. They just take ints in this particular case. But the machinery here is this inject piece. So what happens is that if I have, uh, uh, if I have two algebras that I would like to combine, um, Scalazy provides this concept of inject, an inject type class. Uh, and it looks at, um, so in order to do that, or well, the purpose of that, and we'll show the implementation of that just in a minute, um, we can basically uh, uh, bedazzle our, uh, our free monad with this inject uh, function. And you can say, OK, you need to inject, but you need to inject for some g. Uh, and what we do is then we say, OK, inject fc. So for the, the observant reader, uh, that you know, someone would be like, well, F inject fc is clearly doing all the magic. Uh, so I'm kind of sorry for the following slide, but there's really no way to make it any simpler. Um, so you know, it, 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 we're going to go through it, so don't worry too much. Um, so. This is really interesting. And this is really interesting for a couple of reasons. So I'm going to add just by anyone who's looking at this code and saying, where are your type landers? Uh, we're actually using um, a kind projector. Kind projector. Um, and all it is is anytime there's a question mark, you can basically just imagine in your mind that that's a type lander. Um, and so uh, injectfc just takes the f and the g, and it takes this inject instance. And so what we're actually doing here is this, this first, set, first set, so we've got a, a natural transformation uh, from uh, our, first, our first free to our second C, as it were, our F and our G. And then we say, OK, well, we're going to provide this natural transformation. Uh, and given this, uh, uh, you know, given this free, we're going to uh, use this map suspension function, which is just an implementation detail. It doesn't matter too much. And it's going to be a coordinator. And so then we basically sort of wrap it and unwrap it again for the coordinator piece, uh, because if you remember, the free C was automatically coordinating uh, the argument that we, that we put in. Um, and then we provide the function for that. So we just do a natural transformation for our sort of inner coordinators. Uh, and both of those are coordinator F to coordinator G. Um, and then. Uh, this is obviously the magical piece, this magical trans function, which is coming from the, uh, you know, the FB, the FA there, sorry. So, and all this is, is, and that sounds magical, but it just really isn't. Like, there really is no magic here. It looks complicated. It's super, it's just not. Um, so, the thing is, is that this, all this thing does, it is literally an FA to GA function. And that's all it is. It's just invariant. It's an inject type class. Um, and you just provide the type class, uh, and it knows how to do certain types of things already uh, from, uh, from Scalazy. And, uh, and then suddenly, uh, if we go back, uh, 
I should have tagged it on that. We go back to our, our full comprehension. Suddenly then the compiler can be like, actually, yeah, I know how to convert all of those, all of those different algebras uh, via a coproduct into the same thing, and, it, and then all the types line up. So then suddenly it's like, actually, yeah, and, and the compiler can reason about it at that point. And, and that, that becomes a super powerful thing, because then you can compose lots of different parts of subsystems that are all these different algebras. Um, so we'll just skip along here. So this kind of brings me neatly onto this sort of application design piece. And given that we now know how to kind of construct these free algebras, uh, not have too much boilerplate because we have coordinated to get rid of the requirement for having a functor, um, and we can uh, uh, and we can use coproducts to basically build up, um, uh, you know, the use of different algebras. And in those cases, obviously, I only had two algebras. If we had multiple algebras, uh, then all I would need to do would be to say, uh, you know, I have a coproduct of coproducts kind of thing, uh, and you can do that and nest them, you know, as much as you like. And uh, that gets a little bit more complicated, but uh, you know, we can talk about that after if someone's interested. So, so how, how do we how do we design systems in light of these free algebras? What does it actually allow us to do? And so, uh, really common, super common thing. Uh, I mean, microservices are like the talk of the town, but uh, um, you know, generally speaking, if you have some service, you can actually break it up into lots of different free algebras. And so, um, what we typically do is, um, like our storage will be a free algebra. Uh, Rob was talking earlier about Doobie. Uh, Doobie is implemented as a free algebra. Um, and uh, whether or not we've got some other subsystem, so maybe we use Doobie for uh, our storage, and we've got some other uh, our storage commands or an algebra around the Doobie algebra, and then uh, uh, we might have some other subsystem, like maybe it's doing some, you know, some network I/O to another service or something like that. But we always model uh, the discrete subsystems uh, into different free algebras, um, and then it turns out, well, sort of using coproduct. Uh, we can actually make sort of our domain logic. And so our domain logic is kind of like uh, basically just a program, or indeed many, many programs usually is what it is, um, of saying given, uh, given all these discrete uh, algebras for doing different parts of the system, what we can do is we can actually say, okay, like I want to call this subsystem, write to the database, do this, do that, do this, and you know, obviously you need to handle certain failure modes if you're going over the network and things, uh, but from a logical perspective, uh, you can compose all of these different things together uh, into kind of one neat package. And so, uh, if you're sort of maybe, maybe you're thinking, oh, you know, this co-product stuff sounds kind of gnarly. Uh, you know, there is an option. Uh, the other option, which is you know another way we you know sometimes do it, uh, we sometimes say that our domain logs is kind of set up with uh, just a simple Kleisley. Um, uh, I won't even go into Kleisley because that's you know if someone else wants to, you can look it up online. Um, but um, uh, then the key thing is is that from an edge of the world perspective, if, whether or not it's HTTP, whether or not it's remotely, whether or not it's something else. Um, you know, it, you just don't care. All that layer becomes so you don't you stop caring about whether or not it's play framework, whether or not it's uh, well not play framework, but if it's like HTTP 4s or whether or not it's unfiltered or you know whatever it happens to be, all that is just implementation detail, and you just stop caring about it. And and that's a really wonderful and empowering thing because you know if I want to migrate systems from one version of something to another, or, or I want to migrate I want to migrate from HTTP to to RPC or or provide RPC and HTTP, for example, then all I need to do is that layer uh, only ever then becomes a function um, which takes uh, whatever particular wire input, so maybe it deals with serialization, like in the case of HTTP, it might be HTTP and JSON. Uh, if it's RPC, then we have all the remotely plumbing. Um, and then all I need to do is basically just get that to the point where I can call my function, uh, which is calling my, uh, my, my domain logic, uh, my, my other algebra uh, inside the application. Um, and then uh, those programs call other programs, so on and so on. Um, and uh, uh, it allows us to completely decouple everything and test the entire core of the application without uh, without having to deal with any of the concerns of, of you know what wire protocol is it all that kind of stuff and, and that's important but it's it's a separate thing and typically we wanna we wanna gain high confidence in the kind of our domain logic and our core functionality of whatever it is we're building you know before we kind of really sort of drop down and start to concern too much about uh, uh, you know our, our sort of protocol formats. Um, and so the sort of subsequent thing you always you well, not always but often. Uh, Often you kind of end up in a situation where there's sort of this other discrete part of the system, um, and it would be like, well, you know, we've got some cleanup task or something that's running in the background, or you know, something that something that needs to happen in a service. And so typically, uh, um, typically this can simply be modelled with a uh, with a Scala Z stream, and it turns out that. Um, you know, as it would happen, uh, this is basically just the same thing, um, but in reverse. Uh, we can have our domain logic basically generate events that publish onto this internal stream, um, 
and we can actually, uh, or you know, or we can we can basically leverage our existing uh, our existing domain logic. I just noticed the arrow is actually the wrong way around about this. The stream can actually reuse our existing algebras. So in the same way that um, in the same way we would package it up so that like the HTTP site could come and call the domain logic, the stream can also invoke it because it's just functions. And so. Um, uh, the only slight difference here being that the end of the world is obviously not not a network request. Uh, it's kind of typically just terminating in some kind of sync. Uh, so it's just some kind of background side effect. Uh, if you're not familiar with Scholarly Stream, uh, all it is is it's basically just a, a stream of, um, as I say, a sync is just a stream of an infinite stream or an infinite list. You can think about it like that. Um, where uh, uh, there's functions from whatever our A is, uh, that's to say whatever type of stream it is, uh, to unit. And then when it gets to the sync, the end of the world is basically just run those functions. Uh, and that's all it does. So it's super, super awesome. So the edge of the world just becomes the sync, um, which is just the inverse. So this all sounds a, bit, a little bit abstract, so I'll just uh, show a very quick example um, just to kind of give you some kind of idea about how this sort of split, splits up. Uh, so this is just a very small snippet from one of our systems. Uh, so HTTP 4 service, super simple. Um, it mainly serves, services an API that's used by a command line client. Um, so uh, all this thing does, it's like we get, we've got some, uh, we've got some, uh, uh, some you know, inbound stuff. What path is it? What, uh, you know, what protocol specifics do we have? Uh, and then, then all we have is, uh, you know, how do we handle the result from our domain function, uh, which just gives us a, a you know, some sum. Uh, you can see that this is the domain function. So in this in this particular case, it wants to know information about a particular data center. Um, and then all we do is we say, you know, was that a data center thi a thing or not? And you know, and then the our, the plumbing we have in the domain layer handles all all the error logic. Uh, and so it's not shown here, but we have some in intermediate middleware for HTTP four S that basically automatically handles all the error response and error response formatting and all that kind of stuff. So by the time it gets to this particular point, we already know, you know, we actually got a result. Uh, that's to say our task was was actually going to succeed. And uh, um, and so that kind of totally decouples us. I can I can replace whether or not it's HTTP four, I think I just replace it in an afternoon. I don't I don't I don't care about these details. Uh, obviously if I want to provide like, you know, OK versus, you know, 200 OK versus a 404 or whatever. That's a protocol detail, but as you can see here, it's super simple and, and you know, we don't really, uh, uh, we, we used to waste a lot of time on these things and we just, we just don't now. It just is so simple. Uh, and so from this perspective, like, you basically end up with like a task that, or, you know, the edge of the world, the network request comes in, so it hits the service um, and um, so the actual edge of the world, obviously, there is a server running. So you know, there's ultimately a unit. But what happens is that then it's a task which is basically running other tasks, which are running other free algebras, which are ultimately boiled up into tasks. So you can kind of see how this sort of, you build up these sort of programs of programs of programs of programs uh, kind of thing. And uh, you just build up trees of programs, and uh, it turns out it's actually super super nice. So um, you know, often feels a little bit kind of space age doing some of this stuff. So it's not. Um, it, it really isn't that hard though. I kind of mock myself with that. It's not. Um, uh, it's not something that we. It's not something that we kind of make people shy away from, or we don't cover it. It just. It's. We make it so easy internally um, that there's. Uh, there's using the monads and, and on all this all this plumbing. You know, it doesn't require you to know the in absolute intricate details of every single thing about how it works. I mean, if people are interested in that, absolutely. Um, I mean, the previous speaker was talking about. Uh, um, you know, why it was that. Other people didn't, you know, they shy away from that stuff because it was some kind of scary words, or whatever. You don't need to know that stuff in order to use it, and that's the really beautiful thing about this, you know, all this stuff. You know, I don't. Ha if I if I was to go to a new person on our team and say, hey, you know what, uh, I just need you to, you know, bang out this co-product of free algebras, then obviously that's incredibly intimidating for them, and, and you know, and so we don't actually do that. We just say, hey, can you, you know, look at exactly what's there, and you know, we just need slight modifications. And actually, many people are actually very, uh, very capable of doing that without actually understanding how all the pieces work, and and that's really awesome. So. Um, uh, and I think functional programming kind of enables that. Uh, I'll be talking about that in a little bit. But, um, I think that, by and large, uh, if you separate all the discrete subsystems into free algebras, um, there are only a couple of different, only a couple of details that kind of really matter. Uh, there are some awkward semantics about uh, context switching uh, you when using task, but I guess that's kind of a talk in and of itself. Um, as I see, we're kind of running out of time. So I just want to talk quickly about technical debt. 
because uh, this is something that comes up frequently and people always ask about it. Um, you know, we have people who are learning and people who, uh, you know, some people are rock stars, some people have been doing Scala for 10 years, some people have been, you know, doing Scala for like 10 months. And, you know, how do we, how do we mitigate this, basically? And so, firstly, we accept that it will happen. Minimization is, is the absolute best you can hope for. Technical debt will happen because we all learn. Um, we were having a conversation just last night at dinner that, uh, you know, uh, sort of my current self kind of helps, you know, hates sort of myself from six months ago because, you know, I wish he was a better programmer. And, and you know, there's this kind of, uh, you know, inevitable thing in everything we do that, that you know, we have, to, we have to accept the fact that technical debt will happen uh, and embrace that. And so if we embrace the fact that technical debt is going to occur uh, in a distributed system, a large distributed system, um, you can simply push it to the leaves. Uh, and you, the, real, the really thing you really have to be careful about is libraries. Uh, and, and for us, libraries are the key battleground in, you know, in debt avoidance. Uh, so those things typically, once it's in the library, it's extremely slow moving and it's very difficult to remove. Um, so typically, most things that go into production have a one to two year cycle for getting rid of those things. So, so you know, that makes you think very carefully and considered about how we put APIs in and, and what we put APIs in and, and uh, you know, for how far we distribute them. So um, the only other note I just want to make is that uh, being consistent, as if you're in a larger company, um, having not everybody produce libraries is actually amazing because then, then it frees them up to focus on their product, focus on their service, um, and then we, uh, so internally, if you have a team that basically is publishing libraries or publishing core systems for the rest of the group, um, you can get like a consistent level of service, whether or not it's in documentation or whether or not it's in API, and, uh, um, you know, you can hopefully <laughs> avoid, uh, avoid a sort of accidental debt in, in libraries. Um, so the challenge is, naturally, it hasn't been plain sailing. I mean, I, I would you know, definitely not be telling the truth if I had said it was totally plain sailing, no problems. Um, as has been mentioned a couple of times, Scala is not a pure FP language. Um, but the real irony is, is, is actually a, a, this actually can be a really positive thing because it enables beginners. Um, if they need to cheat sometimes and do some I.O., but they ship the product today versus you know, shipping it like you know, 10 weeks from now because they need to understand pure I.O., that's actually very enabling for the business. So, and like I was sort of mentioning, right? Like you accept that technical debt will happen, and and you know they will learn over time. They absolutely will. They're smart, smart, uh, smart folks, and you know they can do it. So it, it's definitely a, um, uh, uh, it's definitely definitely not a hindrance. I wouldn't say, even though we are trying to push everyone to do uh, PRFP, uh, and we'd be super stoked when everyone does. Um, so uh, the other thing, definitely, if you're a larger company, community libraries are. Uh, you know, definitely mixed bag. There are some really awesome ones, and we love the help we get from the community. Uh, people have been beyond helpful, uh, more helpful than I, I would have ever expected. Um, but definitely, um, uh, you know, there's kind of a sort of problem, which is that you know, even though when some people change features, uh, you know, as a larger engineering organization, you kind of care about the really boring things like you know, binary compatibility and maintenance, and like you know, like all these kind of things that. You know they're not particularly exciting, and and you know that often uh, for smaller for smaller projects that they're, they're often not uh, uh, you know not high priority. So we have to be kind of careful with with how we do that, um, and so subsequently we have a bunch of forks of in, of internal things to kind of try and make them uh, uh, you know to make them uh, a sort of more stable release path for us, uh, and that's just implementation detail, but it's something that I think many people don't realize the the you know, the impact that it can often have if, you know, breaking combiner, binary compatibility if you're responsible for maintaining a community library that's used by many people. Um, GC, uh, our old friend, uh, is definitely re real and present danger, uh, particularly for functional stream processing. Um, we learn an awful lot about functional stream processing and, and, and the issues with GC. Um, it, it's for very high volume streaming. Uh, the JVM probably just isn't the right platform. Uh, and doing it in a functional way kind of uh, doesn't... Uh, uh, it, it doesn't doesn't really enable you uh, in the way that I perhaps might like, um, but um, so if you are doing like if you're planning to do sort of like you know billions and billions of sort of elements on your streams every day, um, you know you probably don't want to be doing that in a functional manner. Um, I mean, it could there are potential routes to make it work, but those things are, are very very involved and not probably for the average user. Um, but uh, so yeah, just to say that that's definitely a definite challenge. Um, yeah, and ensuring users don't revert to Java, uh, you know, and that's definitely uh, that's something we, we tackled with a lot maybe two or three years ago, but uh, typically right now we don't have a huge problem with it, which is awesome. Uh, so wins. Um, oops, I just realized this is actually the older version of my slides, but we'll, we'll make it up as we go along. There we go. So um, uh, so doing FP has actually really allowed us a few different things. Uh, it's a, allowed us to employ some, some really brilliant people. 
Um, and they are brilliant. And the thing that the thing that has kind of continually blown me away is how adaptable people are. Um, you know, we often hear that um, you know some people will maybe never learn functional programming. Maybe they're not interested. But uh, the thing that I've kind of continually been astounded by is people's ability to learn, uh, despite you know di people will learn at different rates at different speeds, but they will get there. And that is the that's the sort of you know eternal thing. I, I think people people have just coped amazingly well, uh, despite the fact that we kind of have essentially thrown them in the deep end with a lot of these things. We make it simple every turn we can, uh, and you know we enable them in an automatic way as best we can. But you know there are some things they have to learn, and and yeah, people people do amazingly well, and I'm super proud of everybody. So, um, uh, but yeah, so the application of our free and co-free and fix and all the other things that have been talked about so far during the conference, uh, you know, ultimately these things make your, your application cheaper over time. Um, you know, refactoring is easy. Uh, just one small segue, I've only got a few minutes. Um, we had a system for basically software update, and it uh, turns out that software update is super expensive if you get it wrong, because uh, if, you, if you brick people's devices in the field, uh, well, you know, they actually have to be returned, because there's no way for them to, uh, uh, you know, to fix it if it, get, if it gets the wrong software deployed on it. So, um, so we basically built a system that values correctness over any, everything else. It's very, very heavy on type-level programming, and uh, um, if it compiles, it will work, and it will always issue software updates correctly. And the last three years, it has never, ever, ever issued the incorrect software update. And that is awesome, because the system it replaced continually would do that periodically if it got configured wrong, and uh, because it was all runtime. And uh, uh, so we're super proud of the actual wins uh, that, that functional programmers actually managed to get us. So definitely, uh, uh, you know, it's not vaporware. There are some very serious, uh, uh, very serious business gains to be had, uh, you know, by doing typed, uh, typed functional programming. So conclusions, uh, just as a quick roundup. Um, you know, free and code, free and code would really do allow you to build uh, modular testable systems uh, from smaller discrete programs, and that's really awesome for testability. Uh, running Scala has been generally a positive experience, but it's definitely not zero cost. Uh, you have to be aware of what you're getting into and, uh, and make sure that you staff it appropriately um, and give people uh, give people room to fail uh, because they will if they're new to the language, and and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. That's part of learning. But uh, as an organization, you have to be prepared to. Uh, uh, you know, to give them room to fail and and, uh, and and support them to succeed in absolutely every way you can. Um, team education continues to be a hard problem. Uh, every other organization I speak to uh, has the same problem. Uh, that just tells me that, uh, you know, uh, education is, is really hard and uh, uh, there's no single solution. You need a multi-pronged solution and it will be different for every single team. Um, but it's something you need to invest in and continue to invest in over time. Uh, one just quick mention. Uh, Scholar Center, I know Raul mentioned it, so I'm going to plug it again. We need the community's input. Uh, there are some really important topics being discussed by Scala Center. Uh, for those who don't know, it's basically an advisory board, uh, partially enterprise, partially community. Uh, but we absolutely need um, partially, you know, Lightband, EPFL, uh, you know, everyone who has a big stake in the Scala, in the Scala, Scala language and the Scala community. Uh, and you know, we need your input. We need the community to, to look at you know, to look at pull request comment. If you think proposals aren't where the language should go, please comment. And and so uh, that all the all the proposals are open. Uh, if you do that as a uh, if if any advisory. Uh, board pull requests are open. It means there's a proposal that can be reviewed. And uh, right now we have a, a proposal out uh, both from Verizon and Goldman Sachs uh, that uh, uh, kind of is, is focused primarily on the migration path to Dotty. Um, so if anyone's interested in that or you, you have an investment in Scala, uh, definitely check it out because it, that will you know potentially affect where where the migration path for Dotty ends up. And we would love 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 your input. Um, so with that, uh, we're at 45 minutes, so I will say thank you very much, and I'll happily take a couple of questions if, if I'm allowed. And uh, yeah, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Yes, Rob. So early on you mentioned the H-list. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Ah. So I guess when I mean gateway drug, um, I guess I'm talking more from the sort of fleshy software perspective in the sense that um, it's something that people, uh, 
is not necessarily, it's something they've never used before. And then when they come to it, they kind of feel empowered by using it because of that, oh, wow, I actually got that to work. And, and there's this real feeling of accomplishment. And typically what we find is that that bolsters people to go on and do other things because they'll be like, yeah, I understood that page list thing. I can totally understand this code product. And, and that has sort of been very, very enabling for us um, because it gives people confidence. And we do use it all over the place. But yeah, largely it is, a, a, I mean, it could theoretically be replaced for some of the things it could be replaced in, but other things not. Um, so yeah, by and large, I would say the biggest win from it is, is, is sort of that fleshy aspect that it really gives people confidence to, to go and look at other things because it's something that the mental gap between that and what they know is much, much smaller. So um, definitely, a, um, um, definitely a good gateway drug, I think. Yeah. Any other questions? Got crickets? All right, cool. Well, uh, if anyone has got any other questions, find me in the hallway. Happy to answer them. And, uh, yeah, thank you very much for listening.